This program is brought to you by the friends and partners of Biblical Life TV. Deep waters to nurture and empower the remnant for the last days. There is a power that is about ready to be released from heaven to those that seek after the things of the kingdom of God. When it comes to the word of God, there is a supernatural unction of the Holy Spirit to learn. God is up to something for those that will study to show yourself approved. Right now there's a lot of things in the kingdom that God is trying to establish that goes against people's theology. You need to understand your roots, where you came from. God may require us to change what we're doing to make walking in the kingdom a higher priority than it ever was before. We were never called to have a little light. We were called to be ablaze with the fire of God in this generation. Join the remnant from around the world who are empowered by the Word of God to fulfill God's purpose in these last days. God is speaking something different. That is going to be essential in the days ahead, and that's part of this anointing that we have to have. Prepare yourselves for spirit-filled teaching. Biblical Life TV. So Paul was writing about the principalities, powers, and rulers of darkness. There are principalities and powers of rulers of darkness over Western society that are now in ascension because the church went to sleep in Laodicea. We're too worried about the best life now. We're too worried about looking as acceptable to the world. There has, there has, over the last 100 years, we have, instead of being the only, re, the, only, the only significance that the body of Christ has is our difference from the world. That is what makes us relevant. We're of another kingdom, walking by new principles, walking by a different drumbeat, talking about transformation, getting free from all that junk. And now walking whole in Christ and walking free of those bondages and, this, and, the, and the influences of culture that destroy homes, it destroys families, it destroys destiny, it destroys purpose, and it brings you under the bondage of the enemy. Okay? The church used to know that. But when you quit preaching the gospel of the kingdom... You stop preaching holiness. You stop preaching the cross. You stop preaching the necessity to pick up the cross and to follow him daily. We end up in this love affair with the world. Well, how are my polls doing? Are you a politician? And let me tell you something. For me, a politician that pays attention to the polls should not even draw a salary because he has no ethics. It will go whichever the way the wind blows. You see, we've got to stand for something, stand for something different. And the Apostle Paul was reminding them of this because these principalities and powers continually manipulate and put pressure on. They will use political correctness to try to control speech. What's so, what's so amazing to me in a nation that one of our constitutional rights is freedom of speech, that freedom is being redefined. Well, I'm offended, so you can't speak. Well, let me tell you something, progressive. Every word that comes out of your mouth offends me and millions of other believers, and we've just sat idly by instead of calling you on the carpet, and it's time for that to change. Now, we've got to do it in love. You got to tell the people the truth in love. If you do it by the spirit of this world, you're going to get the results of the world and you just slid over into the enemy's territory. And I'm finding out a lot of Christians get very rude and very angry. You know why? You don't know the word and you don't have an argument. Your little soundbite doesn't hold up. 
Well, let me tell you something, it never held up when the devil came knocking on your door either. That's why he's living in your living room and he's sitting in your chair with his feet propped up on your, on your, on your, uh, on your coffee table and you don't know it. Because we have gotten so used to being in bondage. Guys, that needs to change. But he said, we wrestle not. In Greek, that's pale, which means to wrestle a contest between two in which each endeavor to overthrow the other, and which is decided when the victor is able to hold his opponents down with his hand on his neck. And right now in America, the church is down, and the principalities and powers have their hand on the neck of the church. We're having occultists and pagans in politics getting to the place where they say Christians shouldn't have a right to vote. That Christians can't be in politics. Christians can't this. Christians can't that. Christians shouldn't be allowed to speak. We had one as far as go that they and all the Jewish people should be locked up. While we have so many Christians that are engaging right now in anti-Semitism, you're in that lump too. It's one of the things I tried to share on, uh, on uh, Eric Walker's show the other day. We're talking about anti-Semitism. And I said, anti-Semitism and anti-Christianism go hand in hand ever since the Reformation. Why since the Reformation? Because what was called Christianity that persecuted the Jews was not true biblical Christianity. It was occultism with a veneer of Christianity. How many know I'm not... I'm not known for beating around the bush about anything. The explosion of sex slaves, pedophilia, murder, the occult, the worship of demons is rampant in America and the church is clueless. One of the things Carl did in his research for his book, and I wouldn't recommend this for you, you have to be strong in the Lord to do something like this, but he would go to the UN meetings where you have all these occultists come together and try to figure out ways to bring about the new world order and the one world religion. And one of the things that helped me, I got excited about was he said, for, you know, they said you'd have the whole room full, they'd all be talking about it until it came to who's going to run it and who's going to pay for it. And he said all these egos flared up and they began fighting with one another and you end up with five people left in the room and I say, thank you, Tower of Babel. It's still working today. But there's coming a time when the son of perdition is revealed that bickering and fighting will stop. But these are people of affluence. These are people that, that have vast sums of money that control what's on the airwaves, that controls what, what the decisions that are made in politics. I used to think that Burning Man was just a big pagan thing that they would go and just, you know, soothsaying and, and, and pagan sacrifice. They have workshops by PhDs, by men coming out of Silicon Valley. We have Pentagon generals going and attending these seminars on how to bring about one world government and one world finances and one world religion with some of what they would call the intellectual giants of our age gather in places like that under the canopy of pagan worship, which is supernaturally empowering their minds to come up with garbage to enslave humanity. I watched a portion of a TED Talk the other day. The guy was a professor out of Oxford. And here's his excuse. You know, you know we have things like the atom bomb. And, and so, you know, normally in society, there's, there's, there's this idea that could raise up that has the potential of destroying society. So here's, what, here's my proposal we got to completely control society using AI and all this. And everybody's going to buy this little truth collar that, that you, you put around your neck. I'm thinking, yeah, there's an explosive in it too in case you say the wrong thing after two or three or four shocks. And it monitors everything that you say, and then it begins shocking you to correct your speech to bring you in line with the global consciousness that we need. And I said, yeah. I said, you know that bad idea that you were talking about that could destroy the world? 
You're the salesman. Because the real ideas that can destroy the world are made in black projects and black budgets that nobody sees that's hidden until it's already a freight train going 500 miles an hour and they think there's no way of stopping it. And one of the reasons that we're seeing a lot of the things that are being made so public in our day is they think it's a freight train that can't be stopped. But historically, I can share with you, the freight train in the past has gone faster. And revival stopped it. Historically, even the Masons will recognize this because they wanted to, to develop a republic which is self-government so laws are supposed to be few, but our morality is supposed to be high. And they said, you know what? If morality ever dips low, that there will be a plethora of federal laws and laws to make the people do what they should do in the first place. And it brings you under tyranny. They understood that it took a moral people to have a republic. And it was only after the great revivals of Jonathan Edwards and Whitfield and all these others they saw the debauchery that was going on in Europe and the debate for the need for the revolution is they are so evil and so corrupt we can no longer be a part of that as a society because we're walking with God. Prior to those great revivals, very, very few people were married in the colonies. They were all living in sin. Very, very few. In fact, a lot of times, France and other nations, and even England did this, they, now later on, we, we see England also doing this in Australia. That's where you send all the criminals. They did that with the colonies. So it was like the worst were sent over. How many know that could be a freight train that's hard to stop? And there was one preacher, and he was preaching in his church. Now, Jonathan Edwards was the kind of preacher that reads word for word. He, he types out his sermon word for word. You can kind of see John Hagee do that, where he's preaching like this, but that eye is always on the page because it's word for word. But he was nearsighted to where he had to hold up his notes like this, and he's reading his sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And God begins to move. The sinners felt the anger of God. Men and women begin to, to grasp a hold of the pillars in the church for fear of falling into hell. And it lit a fire of repentance that began to sweep across the nation, sweep across the colonies, sweep across the colonies. And it was upon that level of repentance and moral change because of converting to the kingdom that enabled a republic to be built in the first place. And so one of the reasons that paganism is pulling that, that rug from underneath the republic is because they want it to crumble. What they're doing today in the gender confusion and every other confusion, even atheism is a form of paganism. Because first they say there is no God and they eventually want to become a God. It always ends up that way. All of this is to destroy a nation with forces that we were supposed to be wrestling and we were supposed to keep them underfoot, not get them. And right now, they, we, first of all, we tried to make friends with them. We, and did you ever see a Dogs trying to, trying to get to know one another. There's one that's a very dominant dog. The other dog will roll over and show its belly. That's what the church has done to the culture in America. Because we forgot that we were supposed to wrestle. Now, the Apostle Paul starts out this whole thing. Take on the whole armor of God. Take on the whole armor of God. And then he goes on to the various pieces. The armor of God is what you need for the wrestling.
And he says, so that you could stand against that evil day. Now, I read that in the 21st century in English. And I think, oh, the day of the Lord and how bad the tribulation period is going to get. He was talking about everyday life and how that there would be an insurrection rise up just like it did in Ephesus. Because that word panerus means full of labor, annoyance, hardship, pressed, harassing by laborers. The other side begins to harass you because you're walking with God is the definition of evil day. So that you can stand against the harassment that begins to be executed by the activists in the culture, by the principalities and powers, you have got to have the armor on. And let me tell you something. I, you know, I remember back in elementary school, you know, going through sex ed. The, there's a new sex ed book being introduced in, in California, and when it starts in California, it goes all the way through. It's, although it's cartoonized, it's graphic, and includes, it includes every conceivable way of having sex. Teaching it to grade schoolers. How many know they're affecting a culture? We have legislation going on right now that, a, that an eight or nine year old can decide they want to have a sex change and the parents, when this new law goes into effect, cannot stop it. Ignoring over a century of psychology that until you get into adolescence and a certain part of adolescence, you cannot even understand something called consequences. In the old day, consequences were, I can understand this, if I do this, there is a butt whipping coming. Okay, and it doesn't go any further than that because your brain is not wired to the place to think three-dimensionally. And so as you enter that, that's the part of the whole thing of, of the, the, the bar mitzvah is, okay, you're going from the time of learning to the time of accountability. It usually begins about 13 so that you can say, listen, if I do this, it's going to start a storm that I don't want to have to deal with. So I choose to do this instead. Because I begin to understand consequences. So we're going to tell children whose brains have not even developed to the place that they can understand consequences, that they can make a choice that will affect them for the rest of their lives. Because culture is demanding it. It is a cultural experiment that will doom an entire generation. And it's not the first time they've tried stuff like this. I remember the, the generation before me in school, they, instead of using phonics in the traditional way of reading, they came up with a new way of reading that was taught in elementary schools for about five years here in America. We have an entire generation that are still illiterate to this day because of it. And now we have Common Core. That are so, but the purpose of it is to so frustrate the kids that they say, you tell us, what four plus four is because I'm not going to make all the dots and all the crazy things you want me to make. It's all about control. When you have somebody with a PhD in mathematics from an Ivy League school looks at, looks at eighth grade common core math and tells you, I don't understand it, there's something wrong. It's something to frustrate and to control. And they're doing it on every level in our society while we're asleep. Let's go to Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. I've got seven minutes left. Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its savor, it shall be, uh, how shall it be seasoned? Then it is good for nothing but to be thrown and trodden under the foot of men. How many know the church today is being trodden under the foot of men because we're no longer salty? We're supposed to preserve the goodness and not let the rottenness begin to take hold. You are the light of the world, a city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. See, that's another area that we missed. We now have a gospel of no works. 
you get saved and you set down in your blessed assurance and you don't do another thing the rest of your life. Salvation is not by works, but the Apostle Paul was succinctly clear. We were saved unto good works. And so if there's no good works, it's possibly because you're not saved or you have a real bad theology, one or the other. That they might glorify our Father in heaven. It's time to learn to be salt and light in the earth again while walking in the love of Christ. In my discussion with Carl, and it's the last uh, uh, kingdom war room, God had him go down to Burning Man and go down to some of these things. And so he's sitting there, and he, he actually borrowed from the Apostle Paul and so he just had a little sign out in front of his tent say, we're dedicated into the unknown God. And had a lot of really interesting conversations. But you hear, you hear these pagans and these witches and different things share with one another in supposedly a Christian free zone. And they begin sharing the horror stories of how they've been treated by the body of Christ. A woman was a witch and she said, you know, there are Christians out witnessing and And uh, when they found out that I was a witch, instead of telling me about Jesus, they went and got a bag of garbage and dumped it over my head. Yeah, that's showing the love of Jesus. We've got to rethink. We've got to be sound in who we are in Christ. God wants to give divine strategies. I had uh, one of my daughters in the faith. God is using her in Malaysia. And uh, she took what she's learned from biblical life and a lot of other professors. And I love the title of her book, No Commitment, No Covenant. And that is what she is teaching from an Asian mindset. And God is opening up doors for her and even ones that aren't even supposed to be open to women, that their denominations do not let women teach. When she's on the mission field, they invite her to come and teach And she's not only introducing them to covenant, she's introducing them to their Hebraic heritage and said, if you have a faith that has no commitment, you have no covenant at all. And that's what we've got to realize. God has called us to be activists, to be light and salt in the earth. Four minutes. What's the number one thing? Okay, now the armor of God is to help us stand against that evil day, to stand against the harassment. What's the number one thing that he lists in Ephesians 6? Each one is in sequential order. You can't go to the second one until you establish the first one. Truth. Jesus said, Father, in his great high priestly prayer in John chapter 17, He said, sanctify them, separate them to the kingdom by your truth. Your word is truth. If we don't get established in the full counsel of God's word and really understand the dynamic of what's being said, understanding what walking in kingdom is, what walking in covenant is, you cannot do spiritual warfare on on, on level two. You cannot affect culture. You cannot stand. I mean, we, we have preachers and preachers' wives on, on the women's retreat going out and taking all the women to get tattoos. Even where God says, I am the Lord thy God, thou shalt not get a tattoo. Pretty plain. That's old stuff. We just had a preacher this week said, you know, we, the, uh, the raising up of the LGBT, he said, we need to accept it all because you can't trust this. You're not in ministry anymore. You're an activist for the kingdom of darkness. If we can't trust this, we're undone. We're without hope. This is truth. And it teaches us to walk in the kingdom that we were born into by the shed blood of Jesus when we were saved. And it's time for us to realize God is calling us to be activists. We need to be like Coach Dave always talks about in, uh, in his seminars. He said one of the greatest things that he can ever hear is, put me in, Coach. 
I'm ready to do something. And the lives that have been changed, the lives that have been changed. Not all of us are called to the pulpit. Not all of us are called to read or write books. But all of us are called to walk in holiness, to walk humbly before God, to be ready to give a reason for the hope that is within us, to be uncompromising yet loving. I'll love you. I'll pray for you. But I cannot be a part of that. I'm sorry. Get somebody's attention. Maybe I shouldn't do that. Maybe I shouldn't be a part of that. And live lives that are so different they can see the blessing in contrast to what they're reaping by how they're living. We have to have that difference. Because we are in the midst of a culture war that is a principality war against the kingdom of God. Now, Father, I ask today in the name of Jesus that you would just light a fire on the inside of us. Father, let it burn out the chaff. Father, let it cauterize the wounds the enemy has put within us. And let it build a determination to walk with you in righteousness, truth, and love. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' name. The fallen immortals that rule the kingdom of darkness have enabled the esoteric societies that control this world to nearly fulfill Nimrod's dark directive. They have taken society down the Luciferian rabbit hole into a technological matrix of darkness. But the Almighty will not allow the enemy to bring his demonic forces for the final showdown without raising up one of his own. God is waking up people around the world who are shaking off their techno-sorcery-induced spiritual slumber and are answering heaven's call. There is an end-time empowerment coming for God's remnant, and it is beginning to unfold in our day. It is time to awaken, be empowered, and become the Sheerith in this generation. The Sheerith Imperative is a must-have tactical manual for God's remnant in the last days. Get your copy at kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. That's kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. Hell may have its directive, but heaven has its imperative. Thank you for watching Biblical Life TV. We hope and pray that today's program edified you in the Word of God. Stay informed. Tune in to weekly podcasts by Dr. Michael and Mary Lou Lake to keep you informed, inspired, and empowered in the Kingdom of God. Tune in to www.kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. That's kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. This video was made possible by our partners worldwide. Please prayerfully consider supporting the ministry that is preparing the remnant for the unfolding of end times prophecy. Send your offerings to Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri. That's Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri, 65746-0160. You can also donate online at store.biblical-life.com. That's store.biblical-life.com.